The history of the 20th century is unlike any other, written in light and movement and sound. It literally reanimates the past. Moving images go beyond telling us who we were to showing us how we were. Much of this record has already been lost. What remains is at risk. Essentially, the 20th century is disintegrating into brown powder and brittle acetate. The originators of this record are all but unknown. From the earliest days of the century, newsreel cameramen focused their lenses on the momentous and the mundane. To grasp the wonder of this filmic history is to see it through the eyes of one of these photographers. My name is Bill Birch. I'm a motion picture camera. That's all I ever wanted to do. Bill's career spans nearly 70 years. He became a full-fledged newsreel cameraman at Movie Tone in the late 30s. During World War II, he served in Frank Capra's Signal Corps unit. Following the war, he returned to the newsreels, first at Fox Movie Tone and then as a freelancer. In 1950, NBC tapped Bill to be the network's head cameraman in the Midwest and charged him with establishing the network's news bureau in Chicago. After 15 years as bureau chief, Bill left NBC in 1965 to open his own production company. He continued to freelance for network news and expanded into documentaries, commercials, and industrials. During this same period, Bill made the move into feature films. As a first and second unit director of photography, he has shot over 40 features, collaborating with legendary directors like John Frankenheimer, Bob Alderich, and Jonathan Demme. Movie making spans generations in the Birch clan. Bill's father, Harry, was a well-respected silent-era cameraman. Bill's son, Randy, followed Bill into the news business as an NBC cameraman. Bill learned to shoot on a hand crank camera. In high school, he shot a popular school newsreel that was a box office success. After graduating junior college, Bill became an apprentice at Movie Tone News. Yeah, I was excited about my first job. Now, I had already joined the union, the cameraman's union, as an apprentice. That allowed me to go out with the crews, to load magazines, to get equipment ready, to learn exactly what they did on a story. So I had the chance to learn the business right from the horse's mouth, so to speak. When cameramen first started shooting news stories, they were everything. They were the director, they were the cameraman, <clears throat> they were the reporter. A reporter with a camera instead of a pencil. And it was all on his shoulders as to what the audience was going to see of that particular story. Following a, a shooting of a story, first thing a cameraman had to do was do his dope sheets. It was a sheet that went to the editor in New York. When he looked at that dope sheet, he found out just exactly what you did and how you shot it. I covered most of the stories that regular news cameramen always did cover. We covered elections. We covered plane crashes. We covered Indianapolis. And we covered feature stories. Just about everything that happened around the country during the year. As I continued uh, shooting my news story assignments, I was certainly aware that there was a war going on, and there was a draft, and I was very draftable. And I had heard bad things about people getting assigned to places that they didn't belong. And I certainly didn't want to become a chef in the Army. So I decided to get a hold of our man in Washington who was in touch with all of this type of thing. And what do you know, he found a new unit starting up. I got into the Army in the Signal Corps, just where I wanted to be. And they put me on a train, but I was an staff sergeant with no training. So I didn't know who to salute or who not to salute. So rather than make a mistake, 
I saluted everybody. <laughs> I continued doing that until a major stopped me in between cars. And he said, Sergeant, we know you're new. And you don't have to salute people the way you are. He said, on trains, you don't have to salute. And only certain officers will you need to salute. And he said, you'll learn that as you go along. But he said, scratch it for now. So I did. The post was the old Fox Western Avenue studio. A working studio, really, but not used very much. But during the war, they were using it. We were introduced to our commanding officer, Colonel Frank Capra, one of the top Hollywood directors. And it was a real experience working with him. Uh, the Why We Fight series started before we were a unit even, and Capra did all the editing on them. Then, after we were formed, we went into shooting stuff for it, showing, again, what the country was doing in our factories, for instance. <laughs> A newspaper office might not seem the right place to begin a report on Washington, but that's where I've been doing it for 27 years. Fitchett's the name. I had an advanced man who found a good newspaper man that we could work with. He was wonderful. Every Sunday since the war, I also put out the overseas edition, a report from Washington to our men and women in the service. That's what I'm writing now. I guess the first thing you'd like to know is whether things have changed back home. What we usually did is talk with Colonel Capra before leaving, getting his ideas of what he'd like to see, how he'd like to have it so it could cut. And we all learned to work the Capra style pretty well. If you're from Washington, you probably remember Renton, the sleepy little village in the tail end of Seattle. I went out there the other day. Right where the big swamp was, they've got a Boeing plant now putting together B-29s. <laughs> Makes us kind of proud when we read about those raids on Tokyo. He knew his city very well. When we told him some of the stuff we wanted to do, he took us right where we could get it. Every time. We've got the Columbia River working in defense, too, at Grand Coulee. Biggest dam in the world, all finished now. The giant dynamos are generating electricity. We worked on this probably for two weeks. But I had an uh, assistant cameraman, a grip, gaffer, a half-ton truck, and then we had a camera car with a platform on top. But where you really see the change up here isn't in the new things we've built. It's what you see in the faces of the people. After all, we've got 200,000 men and women in uniform. Capra, he approved final cut of every show that went overseas. He liked this show tremendously. And like everywhere else, we've got a manpower shortage here. Women doing a lot of jobs men used to do. Arletta Campbell used to be a housewife. Now with her husband Bob somewhere in the Pacific, she's a welder at the Kaiser Yards in Vancouver. Arletta lives out on McLaughlin Heights. McLaughlin Heights is a good place for kids, too. Kids whose dads are overseas, whose mothers work at Kaiser. So all that doesn't have to worry about Sharon. And Bobby makes out all right, too. Every day at five, Bobby takes Sharon down to the bus stop to meet their mom. Being the man of the house now, Bobby helps out with the dishes. And after dinner, Arletta writes to Bob. Sharon usually has a lot to tell her daddy, too. It's a lonely life, but Arletta knows she's not just standing by. She's helping out. Some days she and the kids will take a special kind of walk together and they won't come home alone. Well, I guess that's about it. I could probably have given you a report from Washington in one line. A lot of things have changed back here, but, but the things that count will never change. They'll be here waiting for you when you come home. There was a huge battle uh, called Hill 609 was in Africa. The film that was made there in the battle was lost when a ship was torpedoed and went down. They lost all the film. 
The Army wanted that film badly, so they called Capra and said, if they furnished personnel that had been in the actual battles of Hill 609, could you stage the battle in the desert? And his answer to them was, yes, of course we can. They found the spot out in the American desert that the men that had been in the battle said looked like the area enough to do these scenes. So we immediately sent out there every piece of rolling equipment we could scrounge from the studios, sound trucks, electric trucks, everything we could find. And we started lining up Air Force units with planes of the type that were used there, foot soldiers, infantry, all types of soldiers to work in the, in the picture. And we got everything based in our desert camp out there. The temperatures were hotter, we understood, than they were where they actually did the battles. At night, it would get 100 degrees plus and stay that way all night. In fact, to sleep in the bunks, you had to fill them with water, canvas bunks, fill them with water, and then get in the bed in the bunk before it seeped through and sleep in that water to stay cool enough to go to sleep. It was warm. With the help of the infantry people that came in from the battle site, we staged battles that they wanted footage on exactly the way they had taken place. And we photographed them uh, from good angles so they could see exactly what was going on. And we actually even used live ammunition from time to time, almost to a fault once, but it worked out all right. So it was a little bit like working in the real thing. <laughs> it was a really a nightmare to do. The working conditions were terrible. We came back to a, 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 a post that we didn't have a truck left. We didn't have a, hardly had a camera left. We had to get resupplied with everything. And it was a real, real rough shoot. Command performance was a show in the Army where the GIs from battle zones could write in and say they'd like to see something. For instance, they could say they would like to see their hometown and see Main Street. And in our spare time, where we weren't shooting other stuff, we would be drawn in to shoot them. We set up theaters in the different studio lots and brought cameras in and did these shows on their stages. One GI wrote in and said he would like to see Lana Turner cook a steak. We called Lana Turner. She said she'd do it. The day we were doing Lana Turner, Bob Hope was on the lot, and he walked in, and the director asked him if he would introduce Lana. Well, gang, command performance has filled many an order for those sounds that remind you of home, from the bleat of a billy goat to the fizz of a bourbon and soda. And now comes the ordnance gang at 863 with a letter from Sarge Everett Hankey and Corporal Roland Lipton and this little dilly. It says, Dear Command, in close, please find peace off top of Stuka Dive Bomber, for which you will please have Lana Turner come out and fry us a three-inch porterhouse steak smothered with onions, and let's hear it sizzle. Just to prove there's no request too large, fellas, here she is, Lana Turner. And hi, Bob. Say, have the FBI men found a steak yet? Yes, it's backstage. But, Lana, <laughs> this is dangerous. If this audience sees steak, they'll come right up here after it. Oh, I don't know. They've seen ham all evening, and you're still here. <laughs> right now, I'm bacon. <laughs> Lana, 
and let's get out with this thing. Be a good girl and let's fry that steak, huh? Okay. Bring on the porterhouse steak! <laughs> well, look, they got an armed guard around the steak. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, look at this. Well, all right, Bob. Is your griddle hot? Yeah, my, I think so. My, oh, my. Oh, yeah. That's good. That'll do, Bob. Now, the steak, please. Oh, well, here it is, fellas. Beautiful. A porterhouse steak three inches thick. The only one in captivity. You're going to give that a hot foot? Into the frying pan. <laughs> Oh, no. Oh, yes. There you are, fellas. That's the sound of a steak sizzling. Fellas, that's the steak. That's not me sizzling. That's the steak. And fellas, I wish I could cook a big steak for each and every one of you. She's on her way, men. From us to you, every week till it's over, over there. Well, when the war was winding down and coming to a close, everybody was thinking about what they were going to do. I went back to Movie Town in Chicago. The short subjects department of Movie Town wanted to do a picture on Chicago. And these short subjects were run in the theaters before a feature or instead of like we do today, have commercials. It took me a couple of weeks to shoot this after lining it all up to get to locations exactly when we should be there to get the action and the light correct. Into the meat market of the world come countless carloads of cattle from the plains. Good morning, Sir Lloyd. That was when we had the stockyards. All gone now. Oops, sorry. Oops. Oh, that's all right. I had actors in those shots. Get used to it. Simple pleasures. Simple pleasures. The bazaar of the Western world. Maxwell Street, with its sidewalk shops doing a tremendous yearly business in simple goods such as these. I'm in the Goodyear blimp there. Nice, steady platform to work from. Very much like a magic carpet. <laughs> We just floated across the city. Chewing gum built this fine building. But elsewhere in the confines of the metropolis and on its fringes, people are working while others play. The earth movers, the builders, the steel makers are plying their trades. For Chicago never sleeps in its process of expansion. It's catering to the needs of a nation your life. Viewed from any angle, uh, angle, city life can be fascinating. What was that about women drivers? I seem to forget now. Yes, Chicago has a lot to offer. We undercranked that shot to make the bridge go down faster. Figure that one out. <laughs> now this was a famous night spot in Chicago. And now to dine. Beautiful spot to go. Edgewater Beach, beach walk. Right on the shores of Lake Michigan. And we took it over. Everybody that went in had to sign a, a paper saying they were aware they were being photographed. Champagne is exciting anywhere, but give it the atmosphere of the fabulous pump room, 
And, well, anything can happen. Liver could be exciting served here. In a few hours, the bustling millions rested will again descend upon these quiet streets to live out another day in the life of a great metropolis. But now, the city sleeps. One of the things we covered, we really, really got a kick out of covering, because they were funny. We covered Lou Lair material. Anybody that remembers movie tone news remembers monkeys as the craziest people. That was Lou Lair. If we had like a uh, real heat wave in Chicago, we'd go to the beach and cover a lot of humorous stories about how people were beating the heat. Chicago doing in the big heat wave? All right, thank you. Some folks soak in the cool waters of Lake Michigan. Others just like to soak up the sunshine. <laughs> While the younger squirts have fun playing under big drips. 94 degrees mean nothing to bathing beauties racing on cakes of ice. Went to Oak Street Beach in Chicago and recruited a bunch of bathing beauties. The minute they saw the camera, it was no problem. There's enough ice water in there now to cool off an elephant. And there's the elephant. It's pachyderm versus pulchritude. Look out, girls, it'll be high tide any minute now. Now there is service, another way of watering an elephant. Oh boy, is that good. Now on this side, girls. Let it sizzle, I'm moving in here, trunk and all. So long, kids, call me after Labor Day. So come, working for him was a lot of fun, and we really got a kick out of it. One of the things that killed the theater newsreel was camaraderie. The cameramen got to the point where they were calling each other when the assignment happened and say, are you going? And the other one would say, yes, I am. I'll ride with you. And they finally got to the point where they were riding it all in one car. And you don't get much exclusive traveling that way. I worked for the theater newsreel up until television squeezed them very hard because they were on just a two a week shows for theaters. They couldn't compete with the nightly television news. I was going to work one morning. I always had a camera in the car, IMO, and a fire truck passed me, getting close to downtown. So I thought, I'll just follow it, see where he's going. Boy, it was a warehouse burning sky high. So I grabbed the camera, and shot a couple of hundred feet of 35 millimeter film. Well, when I told my boss what I had done, he went right back to the old days of the two a week. He said, they don't want that. It's a local fire. Never, never, they won't use it. I said, well, can we call them and just tell them what we've got? He said, sure. Well, when he told them what I had done and that they were going to have a story out of Chicago, which was a local story. They just flipped. They said, cut it to one minute. We'll switch to you tonight for that story. The Camel News Caravan presents Today's News Today. And NBC was ecstatic. They had a Today's News Today story. They got a call one day from a man named Frank McCall who was the head of television news for NBC. He said, we want to open a bureau, set up our own television newsreel. Just like the other newsreels are set up, we want to set up our own. What they offered me was a wonderful offer, and I became an employee of NBC News. Ladies and gentlemen, the story of six-year-old Bobby Greenlease is ended. It was announced today the kidnapped boy had been found dead 55 miles from his home. 
This story really says something, because it was in the early days of the network newsreels, nightly news. They wouldn't do this today on, a, on a, any news show, because this story is a very long story, and it ran on the Camel Caravan News, which was a 15-minute news show total, all stories. This is the story of Carl Austin Hall, a man who had every chance in the world, money, position, family, but who committed one of the most ruthless crimes of record, the kidnapping, beating, and murder of Bobby Greenlees. We actually got on this story right from the beginning, and we carried it through right to the end after the trial. I was on this story for several weeks. How about you, sir? Do you know this man? Yes, sir. That's Carl Hall. And he came back after his second turn in the Marines. He seemed cold, not any emotion, no love or feelings in his makeup. Now, after he left here, he spent most of his time around 12th and Baltimore in Kansas City. This is 12th Street. Around Baltimore and 12th were many night spots. Some are still there. Gone are some of Hall's favorites, like Sloppy Joe's, the Hangar Bar, and the College Inn. He used to gamble quite a bit. Then he finally left, and the first thing I heard, he was in the penitentiary. You were Carl Hall's cellmate at the Missouri State Penitentiary. He told me that within six months after he got out of the penitentiary, he'd have plenty of money. He had a lot at one time. And then suddenly he was in the news. He had kidnapped, beaten up, murdered a child, and he got his money back, $600,000 of it. But he didn't get to keep it long. With his alcoholic girlfriend, he was arrested, confessed, now awaits trial. The verdict was going to be announced on a Monday. I talked the judge into letting me shoot him in his courtroom, reading the verdict three different ways. Innocent, guilty, or hung jury. We did this on Friday, and I immediately shipped the film to New York on the next Monday morning. The verdict was announced. I was in a phone booth outside the courtroom on the phone to my boss in New York. I told him to use take two. They were on the air practically while it was being read in court. And when you were a cameraman in those days, you were really a director and a cameraman and a contact man because you did this yourself. The Nathan Leopold parole story was never supposed to happen. He was convicted to life imprisonment, no parole. The Logan Leopold case was a sensational crime. They kidnapped a little boy, Bobby Franks, and committed a hideous murder. But they were caught and sentenced to life imprisonment with no parole. After 28 years, he requested a hearing, and all the press from around the country were invited. Newsreels, reporters, everybody. You could hear a pin drop in the room. Do you feel that you deserve a parole? Well, I certainly hope for a parole. I don't think the question of whether I deserve one is up to me. I do feel that uh, I was only 19 at the time I committed the crime for which I am here. At 19, uh, we don't let boys vote. They can't sign legal contracts. But I was able to commit an act which has cost me so far 28 years and four months of my life. I've tried very hard to be helpful to others as far as I could to take advantage of what opportunities I could for constructive work in here ever since I've been here. I hope that the board will feel justified in giving me a parole. After he finished, it went into private hearing to discuss whether he should be paroled or not. And while we waited for the result of that hearing, all of the reporters took a poll. It came out negative. He should not be paroled. And that's what happened. Leopold came up for a second hearing for a parole. This time he was successful. 
he got his parole. I went down to Statesville to travel back to Chicago with him. He rode in a car and I was in the front seat, he was in the back. Little did we realize that he had never ridden a modern car and it was too fast for him. It made him sick. So we stopped multiple times by the side of the road for him to vomit to an audience of reporters with very little pity. I think there are four categories, and one in all of them. As the world moves in its never-ending orbit, so does the core of NBC News cameramen. These are the highly competent and professional experts who cover the globe. These are the Oscars of the news film business. The top honors go to Bill Birch, who works out of NBC News Chicago. He won first prize in the general news category and for the most effective use of sound on film. Bill took his camera to Little Rock, Arkansas on a hot, sunny day last August. Crowds were gathering to protest the entry of Negro students into Central High School. This was an epic. I was there for weeks. They used Old Glory and the Southern Rebel flag as their shield. As they marched, some sang, Onward Christian Soldiers. A block from the school, Police Chief Eugene Smith was ready for them. To be a news cameraman, you had to be a politician, too. And that meant that when you went on some stories, you had to polish the apple a little bit. The best way to cover something like this was to get to be known by the police chief. And being in with him helped us tremendously in our coverage. He respected us for coming in to talk to him. We told him that we wanted to show what was happening there in the right light, and therefore uh, him knowing what we were doing was very important. He let us put our car in front of the parade. I would ride, camera on top of the car, which I worked with there quite a bit. We led that parade when it happened, to my competitors' great disgust, because they had us in their shot, and if we came into view, a big car leading the parade with a camera on top. We got the shots running with the parade. The parade had stopped. Police chief came on the loudspeaker asking, for the colors to be presented to him. They refused. The police were faced with a problem whether to desecrate the flag or to let the ringleaders go. Chief Smith knew there was only one way to break up the mob, arrest the flag bearers. and everything broke loose, including the water cannons, which we knew about. Politics again, you know? And that water, you couldn't stand up against it. Police chief had received the flag, saved it from falling to the ground, gave it to one of his deputies, and then waded in to the crowd to get the troublemakers. And this all happened right in front of us. Chief Smith then went back to his bullhorn, ordered the students back into the school. The entire ugly affair took an hour and a half, but it will be remembered for a lifetime. Uh, my sound man got hit with a brick. His amplifier got smashed. The car got uh, quite a bit of damage. And the top, which I was standing up on, was a target because they all thought they, we had been responsible for some of this, but we hadn't really. We just said we wanted to cover it right and show both sides. I got a call to go to Cuba, and they said, you'll meet a New York sound man there 
and he's bringing the equipment, and you go to the such and such a hotel and wait for a call from Fidel Castro, and they're going to bring you up into the hills to interview him. I got a call at midnight. Be down in front of your hotel in an hour. So we went down, and we stood in front of the hotel, and a car pulled up, and the doors opened on the car, and the trunk opened. Our camera equipment went in the trunk. We got in the car, and we left. And we wound up way up in the hills. And when we got out of the car, we were met by Fidel Castro. And he said, you, Birch? I said, yes. He said, let's do the interview. And we did a two-hour session with him. And he told us a lot of things about his plans, what he was going to do. He was really just getting started in the revolution. And he said, things are going to change around here. Well, after we finished the interview, he said, you have to get this film out of here, so go with our people. Leave your equipment here. Just take your film. And that's all we took. And we were taken to the shore, and we were met by a high-powered speedboat. And we were ferried across to Florida. We were put ashore, and we had our credentials and everything. We bummed a ride on a truck to get where we could get transportation to get to New York. That film was run all over the place, all over the network. It was very, very solid in Castro's corner because he was telling us everything he was going to do. I went back to Chicago and figured that was it. After the revolution, they called me again, and they said, go down for the celebration. See if you can get an interview with him. We'll send Frank McGee down. We finally got to the right person who I told, I was the cameraman, they photographed him up in the hills. That's all I needed to say. And he said, we'll get him to come up and do the interview in the ballroom of the hotel. A serious concern has developed in the United States within recent days over the activities of this revolutionary government. And there are indications that a massive misunderstanding may be developing between the people of the United States and the people of Cuba. But what you have not seen are pictures of killings and atrocities committed while Batista was in power. They were killed in the street during the night. They appeared in the street in the morning because they were tortured and killed during the day without trial. They, I want to tell to the public opinion of the United States wealthy, we don't do anything without free press here. Dr. Castro, uh, do you know, do you feel there was any way that the United States government, after they had given these arms to Batista, could have kept him from using these weapons the way that he did? Well, of course, yeah. they say now that Batista didn't just uh, uh, agree with what he promised. That he didn't use them as he promised? Yes, uh -huh. because they were for the continental defense. Continental defense. And they knew that. Well, why didn't they uh, return the military mission? Cuba for seven years has been in the iron grip of a dictator. The news that has come from Cuba during those seven years has mostly been all of one side. This is the first time the other side has been accorded full opportunity to tell their side of the story. Long story short, we did the first interview that was done with him after he took power. And we rushed that film to the station, and they processed it in the station in Havana and then transferred it by phone to New York, and as fast as it came off, they edited it in New York, and it was put on while they were still celebrating in the streets in Havana, which was a first. Harry Truman, 
I did a lot of shooting with him. When he was in office, when he got out of office, he and I got along just great. My favorite politician. And perhaps the biggest news of the Missouri primaries was that the first voter in that independence polling place was up and about again. Up early, too, in the Truman tradition of the morning stroll, this time with reporter Randall Jesse on his way to the primary polls. And those morning walks got pretty tiring with that camera, even though it was a hand camera. But at that polling place in Independence, the excitement was that Citizen Truman was back in the ball game, looking a little bit slimmer, but just about as chipper as always. Uh, there was a story going around that McCarthy, Senator McCarthy, had made a disparaging remark about Harry. And NBC called me and said, look, <clears throat> you get along with him very well. Why don't you go down and see if he'll answer what McCarthy said? And he had a little office in Kansas City, which I knew where it was. And he owned a little Dodge automobile, which he drove himself. And I knew where he parked it. So I went in to that lot and waited for him. And I had a handheld camera, a sound camera. And he drove in, parked his car, and I moved right over to it and had the camera up. And I was running. And with that, he slammed his trunk down, took his briefcase, walked directly at me. And as he went by me, I was shooting. As he went by me, he hauled off and hit me in the stomach till I bent over. <laughs> and he said, you stupid bastard. He said, I'm kidding you. Come on, go up to the office with me. We got at his desk and he looked up at me and he said, now what do you want? And I said, well, I want to get an answer from you to a statement that Joseph McCarthy made about you. And I repeated it, just kind of smiled and he reached in his pocket pulled out his wallet and took a $5 bill out, laid it on his desk. He said, cover that. You're a betting man. I'm going to give you the answer, and I'm betting you that you won't use it. Well, I knew him well enough to know that we probably wouldn't use it, but I put the $5 on the desk. He said, I'll answer you this way. He said, I always live by my teachings that I got from my mother. And she taught me early on, never get into a pissing match with a skunk. And he just sat there. And I reached over and pushed the $10 bill, two $5 bills at him. I said, I, I know we won't use it, but they did. They used it, and they bleeped out the word, but they used it. Well, he never got over that. This is Independence, Missouri, the Harry S. Truman Memorial Library. Truman's library was coming up for opening. And Dave Garraway's show, the Today Show, wanted a story on it. They couldn't think of anything that would be different to do for this. I thought of something, and I called the news show, and they said, go for it if you can get it. I went to see Harry Truman, and I said, I got a big question to ask you. And he said, what's that? What do you want now? I said, I would like to take you to the library. Walk around the library with you, with a hand camera, sound and have you tell us about certain things in the library and what they mean to you and why they're important to you. You'll have to go into a studio with us afterwards. Voiceover, we call it. He said, I know about voiceover. He said, sure. Well, let's do it. Today, the finishing touches will be put on his office. The halls will be cleaned. The steps will be finished for the thousands who will come. But this morning, just Harry S. Truman, one man and some of the things that made up his life, such personal things as a piano and his mother's portrait. I owed most of the good things of my life to her. 
Most men owe their biggest debts to their mothers. She taught me my letters and how to read when I was five years old. She encouraged me to read. She was a wonderful mother in every way. There's the old battery guide on. I was 33 when we went to France in the First World War. The fellows in Battery D were some bunch. I remember when Jiggs Johnley and George Woods and some of the other boys cut some bunting out of a YMCA decoration and made this guide on after the first one was lost. After we got home, Bess Wallace embroidered it for me. There's the Bible on which I took the oath of office after President Roosevelt died. I received the sad news from Mrs. Roosevelt herself. A few minutes later, Chief Justice Harlan Fisk Stone arrived, and on this Bible, I took the oath. I will never forget when the fellows who raised the flag at Iwo Jima visited me. The ones who were alive, two had already been killed. No matter how you look at it, war is terrible, and I hope and pray we never have another one. I hope someday we learn enough to harness the atom for peace and not war. In war, it is a terrible thing. The final decision to use the atomic bomb was up to me. I insisted that it be dropped on military target. Five days later, Japan surrendered. Uh, he sat down and he got very, very melancholy a couple of times about some of the things. Steadfast in our faith in the Almighty, we will advance toward a world where man's freedom is secure. Tomorrow, thousands of people of every political creed will be assembled here, but this is the morning for one man, Harry S. Truman, former president, senator, county judge, merchant, and farmer. Today, this edifice is his. Tomorrow, he will give it to the people. It was fun, and he was fun to work with. I shot Truman. I shot Kennedy. I shot Eisenhower. And I shot Nixon. Things can happen on a news story when you least expect, so you have to be ready. Watch the lights over him. See him come down. <laughs> they were ready to fall on his head. It could have been something that might have changed a little history. <laughs> it just shows how things can happen. You have to always be ready. It seems, for your information, incidentally, that what happened was that these lights here uh, had too much load on them, and one of the wires uh, caught fire over here, and it began to fall. And so my Secret Service man came and pulled me and drawn me back here. I want to make it clear that this was not one of Mr. Kennedy's representatives. It was just a natural act of God. After a while, you keep both eyes open. You can see in the finder and what's going on around you. And I saw the lights begin to move, and I went up. I was barely at Thiesley Plaza. I was an extra camera, really. I was on the edge where he entered the plaza after touring the streets. And after he passed me, I suddenly realized people were beginning to move. So I knew something must have happened. It was very serious. So I moved with the crowd covering the mayhem as I went. And I found myself arriving at the hospital, and I was met by the authorities who were asking for all the film that had been shot on his arrival at Dealey Plaza. There was lots and lots of milling around going on because we couldn't do anything. We couldn't go in the hospital, and we couldn't interview anybody when, we, when I first got there out in front of the hospital. Authorities said no. So I milled a little bit, and I milled around over in front of the president's car. And I noticed that the windshield was cracked. I went back among the reporters. I didn't mention anything about it to them. And suddenly I noticed the car was gone. Well, we continued to mill for quite a while, a couple of hours. 
And suddenly we got a call that there was going to be a press announcement made. I went to get my camera for a press announcement, and I passed where the car had been, and it was back. And I glanced at the windshield, and it had been replaced. I left, as all the other cameramen did, to go home. I returned to Chicago to photograph the response of the country to that news. This is a crazy one. It's what they call in the newsreel business a feature story. Because there's no news in it, so it's a feature story. This guy did his act hanging from a helicopter. Same kind of trapeze act, like in the circus, but without a net under it. Now how do you photograph it? I couldn't sit in the helicopter, because I couldn't get out far enough to see him. I talked to the helicopter pilot and we found a two by six plank and stretched it across the runners of the helicopter and tied it down. I sat on that, tied to the helicopter superstructure and photographed him looking right down at him. Hanging by his heels, no net, no ropes, no nothing. He actually hangs by his toes. The master of ceremonies of the show said, we don't know who's crazier, the performer or the cameraman. We got a call from City Hall in the federal building. There was a man standing out on a ledge at the top in the tower, threatening to jump. We had these things quite a few times, and nobody paid much attention to them, because they hardly ever jumped. So I grabbed a, a hand camera. I got up to the floor opposite him. They were trying to talk him down. I got my camera set, and we were ready. And I don't know, you get a sense of what's happening. I just turned on the camera, and he jumped. He landed on the edge of the net. Nothing happened to him. He was fine. And then we all went to lunch. <laughs> This was um, a thrill show. It was Joey Chitwood's show. He played all over the country. This is the way some men make their living. And like this. And this. We tried to get the camera in to the action wherever we could. The camera rode in almost every stunt, and the cameraman was me. <laughs> it was pretty exciting, really. Some of the shots, we just tied the camera down in the cars, and others, I actually rode in. This one, I rode in. The camera was not mounted because of the shock. The answer is here. Thrill show. It was a very successful show for NBC.
1,272,000 people traveled into the Black Hills of South Dakota last year to gaze in awe at this scene. To film I received a call one day from Reuven Frank, and he said, can you come in? I've got a story I want to do. You know of Mount Rushmore, of course. I said, yes. It suffers during the wintertime from runoff, water and stuff, and they have to patch it up. Once a year, they send a man over the top in a bosun's chair on a winch that's mounted on the top of the monument, and he backs down over the faces with a bucket with it's sort of a granite material. I said, I think I know what you're going to say. He said, yes, I think you do. <laughs> he said, I want an NBC camera to go over with him and walk on the faces with him and talk to him about what he's doing and why he's doing it. I said, well, I need another wench up there to do that. He said, I've already talked to them and they will put another wench up there for us. I said, okay. I said, I'll do it. Getting to the monument is not easy. There is no road. Pack animals cannot be used. The men must walk, carrying all of their equipment. And we got out to the monument. I had a sound man, <clears throat> myself, and quite a bit of equipment. And we had to get it to the top of the monument. They did have the second wench up there and the bosun's chair. And when they explained to me how I had to sit in that bosun's chair, strap in, hang the stuff on the sides that I was going to have to take with me, and get the camera on a brace on my shoulder, <laughs> I didn't uh, think it was going to be any easy chore. I backed down and I got about in here, and I could see what they meant about the cave for the eyes. They were huge. And I went on down in this area. Well, down the other side, he came, and he looked into the eye. There were some spots that were going to need patching. Well. We moved around on the face, face that way, that he would take his position, then I would get my position, uh, walking on the face <laughs> to uh, best see him and talk with him. Well, we we did very well until all of a sudden I was aware that the light was getting bad, and I looked up and there was a big storm coming in, and over the radio it came to both of us to get into the eye and stay there. The storm broke and it poured. Looking out from the, the inside, you couldn't see a thing because it was a total waterfall. And when it finally began to subside and the water stopped a little bit, I made some shot that turned out nice. Didn't fit the story at all, but it was nice photography. <laughs> but we did this, I was over the faces for the entire day doing this. And boy, I knew it that night. My legs felt like they didn't belong to me. But it was fun anyway. And we did the story, and it got aired. The modern reality of the Outback is best observed on a tour with the Royal Flying Doctor Service. This was a one-hour documentary on Australia and life there. It's medical time now. Station's wanting doctor. Come in, please. The three-engine plane and the airborne doctor are the new symbols of the outback. It was done for Chet Huntley, NBC Dr. News. Robert North and his colleagues at Broken Hill cover an area one and a half times as big as Texas, half a million square miles. I was the cameraman and the director and the location producer with one sound camera and one silent camera. I wanted to be on both sides of the sound, lip sync. For instance, here at the ranch and in the airplane with him. Center of his chest, and um, he's very pale and sweaty. With one sound camera, we had to do these things two and three times to uh, sync them all up. 
Cobb North now heads to Lonsdale Station, 200 miles distant. The hum of the tri-motor is a reassuring sound to the rancher, whose home may be 200 miles from any other civilized outpost. The Thomas Ranch at Lonsdale, 170,000 acres, 8,000 sheep. The patient Bob North is calling on, Jim Thomas Sr., is an outback pioneer. In his youth, illness at one of these isolated stations could often mean death. Today, the flying doctors can be raised in a minute or two by radio, by day and night, and generally a lot faster than you can get a physician in New York City on a Friday. Often, a patient will be examined, taken aboard the plane, and transferred to a hospital bed in less time than it takes in a big city. In the outback, doctors fly, and school lessons are broadcast. Philip and Cheryl Thomas get their schooling via shortwave radio. This was another epic to shoot. <laughs> and explaining to these kids what, what we were doing, it was amazing how quickly everybody caught on and did exactly as they were asked to do. We made the schoolroom the master shot. Fit and well, I hope. This is Mrs. Phyllis Gibb, principal of the Broken Hill School of the Air. Her classroom is 600 miles long, 180 students. And then we played back that night everything on quarter-inch tape, and we knew just exactly where we had to go to fill in the things that took place, like these. And the first thing we're going to do is to have some quick tables. Eights, 56. 8 PT, Cheryl, five nines. 45. These kids all had parts that day in their schooling. We moved very quickly, did a lot of re-recording overnight to do all these cuts and make it appear that we were every place at the same time. That was a pretty good trick completely wound up at night talking to myself after doing all this. John Chancellor was a great advantage and a great help in our department. And he always said, and I will admit to it, that I was a lot responsible for hiring him. We did a lot of stories together, and he was the type of reporter that respected the news cameraman as the head of the crew because we were the ones that saw the film through the finder on our cameras and we knew what was going on that film. This is Brookdale Drive, Alamogordo, New Mexico. Like so many American streets, you can't tell on the surface what troubles and tragedies take place inside these houses. Well, NBC heard about the story and called me and sent John Chancellor and I out to New Mexico to do a story on it. But in this house, they know what tragedy means. This is Ernest Huckleby, steady worker as a school janitor. Take home pay, $62 a week. Not enough and when we arrived, the father was out working in the property, and we got to him and explained ourselves to him, who we were, and what we would like to do. And this is another place where Ernest Huckleby tried to make ends meet, and it is where the tragedy began. Just outside of Alamogordo here, Ernest Huckleby raises hogs, hogs to be sold, hogs to be butchered for his family into bacon and pork chops. As far as we can piece the story together, Huckleby got some grain to feed his hogs, but it was grain not intended for feeding, but rather for planting, and it had been treated with a deadly mercury fungicide. Huckleby didn't know that, and he fed it to the hogs. This is what untreated grain looks like, and this is what grain looks like when it's treated with mercury fungicide. Not much difference, hard to tell the difference. The mercury fungicide is designed to protect the seed in the ground. But when it is introduced into a living organism, its effects are slow, undetectable, and ghastly. Well, he bought into what we were doing, and he allowed us to photograph his family, the kids that were still there playing, and then sit down with him and do an in-depth interview. The mercury fungicide is safe in the ground, protecting seeds, but in a human being, it's a killer. At first, Nobody knew what was wrong with some of the Huckleby children. An early diagnosis was sleeping sickness. 
But before long, they found out. Mercury poisoning. And then John said to me, what I think I'd like to do would be to talk to the mother. But the hospital and the law says no interviews with the mother. So I said, well, it kind of gives us a problem, doesn't it? He said, not really. I want to dress up like two doctors tomorrow morning. Make a trip to the hospital. You carry your camera, which was a handheld sound camera, underneath the robe that you're wearing, which I got the large robes so we could do this. I said, what do you mean you got? I said, have you got these already? He said, yeah. He said, I knew you'd go for it. Well, the way he described it, it sounded very plausible, but very crazy. But I said, fine, let's try it. So next morning, we did this. When we got to the hospital, we got the robes out, put them on, went in the side entrance, and Jack was constantly talking, of course, and he said, if we pass any, any doctors and they say, hello, just nod your head, don't, don't talk to them, just nod your head. They do that all the time. We climbed the first flight of stairs and we ran into two doctors coming down. And they said good morning to us and we nodded our heads and just kept them down and we kept walking. And we got in the room, set up the equipment, one roll of film in the camera, and we were ready to go. He did his interview, which was very good. Have all of your children been born normal, Mrs. Huckleby? Yes, they have. So you're a good, healthy mother and you have good, healthy children? Yes, sir. Are you afraid for this one more than you have been for the others? Yes, I am. What do you think ought to be done? You're no expert or anything, but just as a mother whose family has been hurt very badly by this, what do you think ought to be done? Well, I, I don't know. All I, all I said that we could do after the doctors was such so puzzled over, all I know that we could do was to pray. Mrs. Huckleby is expecting another baby. She has the poison in her system. We got out the door, got out onto the roadway, and I looked in the rear mirror, and I saw a police car. And I said, Jack, did you plan for the police car too? Because there's one behind us. He said, oh, fine. He said, just keep going. Well, he followed us, and we started for the border which wasn't far, and Jack said, you know, we forgot what, something. He said, we haven't gotten the establishing shot of where they bought this stuff. We got to get that. And I said, oh, wonderful, with a cop riding right on our tail, and I looked in the rear mirror and he was gone. He evidently either got a call or he thought, we, we were scared and we were going to leave. And we drove out of there and got away, got the story out of there, and it was, we shipped it and it was used that night on the Huntley Brinkley show. When Capote first came to Holcomb and Garden City, most of the local residents had never heard of him. Today, his in cold blood is known here simply as the book. They were going to do a movie on his book, on a, this big killing that had taken place out there. I was supposed to cover him while he was there, signing books, and they wouldn't allow any, any coverage at the house, so I didn't go out there. When I got the assignment, I didn't think I was going to like him at all. I did like him. He was a very nice man. He did cooperate totally with what I wanted to do. We're not doing this now. Oh, we are doing it. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't understand it. Oh, well, this... <clears throat> well, it's very nice to see you, Jolene. Jolene is Jolene Katz, who was the young girl in my book who went to the Clutter House that last morning and baked the cherry 
car with Nancy Crutter. She was one of the last people to see them at the house. And you can see how Jolene from that very little girl has grown up to be a very, <laughs> very pretty young lady indeed. So nice. Shooting over his shoulder. Show the people, not him. Because that, that's who he was signing those books for. I thought that was more important, and I played it that way. This lady, grandson, sent me the book to autograph. It says, for Grandma, hope you enjoy this book and don't be too critical of the author. <laughs> he, he was teaching school here. But really. And he said, you know, he said, I, I, I understand now what you're doing. Because he said, I, I didn't understand first that what you were doing you're telling a story in pictures. I said, that's right. And the people out there, which was a big surprise to me, really, really loved him. They thought he was just great. He was invited to houses for dinner. And, uh, they couldn't get enough of him. A lot of people here in town who have known uh, each other for a long period of time have admitted that Truman described them better than they could have, <laughs> including us, I imagine. <laughs> uh, there were reporters from uh, all over the country uh, descended here on uh, Garden City. And uh, uh, Truman was uh, a little different than the others. I think that, uh, well, to me, he uh, his dress and uh, he, 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 in uh, other words, he was more or less uh, continental. He and I did hit it off very well as far as what we were going to do. Ready? Now, can you I said, well, the first thing I'd like to do is get a picture of you in front of the post office. Ready? When I first came out here to western Kansas at the time of the Clatter murder case uh, with the idea of working on this book. I didn't know anyone out here, and it took a great deal of time before I did. It was, for me, a very strange and different atmosphere than anything I was used to. And I guess I was uh, something quite different from anything they were used to. But well, he loved it. He, he thought posing for the pictures was wonderful. This building behind me is the post office, or what the folks around here called the federal building. It happens that in this particular building is the first interview that I had in connection with the book when I first came out here. It seemed to me a logical thing to go to talk to uh, the postmistress in the town. So I came here to the federal building and became very close friends with postmistress Myrtle Clare, now retired. We were shooting and she walked by and thought it was wonderful we were shooting pictures of it. And we got to know her then, so we decided to talk with her and see what, what she would do. And she was pretty good. What do you think of Truman? I think he's just really a wonderful fella. Tell us about the first time you met Truman and what you did. Well, when he came in, he was such a little fella, I thought, well, who's this little kid coming in? <laughs> and he told me what he was going to do. And then he and uh, Nell Harper were in there several times a day. and ask uh, questions. He never took a note on anything. And then b before we left, he did a reading <clears throat> out in one of the uh, sheds in Kansas near the town. And, and a lot of people, it was a cow shed, and he had a lot of people there. And he gave these three readings that he had written. And it was very impressive the way the audience paid attention to him. I was impressed. Good evening, and thank you so much for coming here this evening. I'd like to explain what it is that I'm going to do. Uh, this first story that I want to read is, um, may seem a curious choice because the subject of it is Christmas but it's so darn cold out tonight, I don't think you'll notice the difference. <laughs> and the reading, I thought the reading would be something to see, because, you know, Kansas people, there's a lot of cowboys out there, and rough and ready guys. And I thought it would be interesting to see what the results would be. And he was really, really 
blanked. On behalf of the Garden City Library Board, we want to show you our appreciation for your coming here to Garden City and autographing books in our library. It's been a privilege to have you. Well, thank you very much. It's been a great nice. privilege to be here. Thank you. <laughs> I've been asked many times why I think news shows today aren't the same as they used to be, and in my mind, not as good. I have a stock answer for that, because I think it's the truth. When we shot news, we put a little story together. We had a beginning, a middle, and an end to our coverage. They don't do that today. They just put a bunch of cuts together, and you see the event, but it's not a little story. It's not interesting to the viewer, I don't think. They, they just glance at it, and they never did that when we were doing the news, because in my era, the audience, they wanted to know what the story was, and they watched, and that's why I think it's different today. Gone with the 20th century is the shooting style of the newsreel cameraman. Their collective photographic efforts created the visual memory of civilization's most tumultuous 100 years. Whether they intended to or not, they authored a new kind of history, a history as unique as the century itself. The importance of preserving this legacy cannot be overstated. Without these moving images, the century will quite literally fade from memory the richest and most democratic history ever recorded will be no more. <laughs>